Morning. Hello. Everyone uh, prepares for sermons differently. Um, and most of the time, when someone is preaching, they will have been uh, taught sort of how to do it. They'll have had some sort of training. Uh, but still, each one of us uh, will come to it in a slightly different way. Some will prepare by getting loads of books and reading through all these different understandings of the passages and seeing what other people have thought and considered over the years. Some will take the passage and, and meditate on it, will spend time just reflecting deeply within the words themselves. Some may talk to others about the passage, hear from the community of believers about what they think the passage means to each of us uh, in, in this present day. For me, I usually try and read the passage well in advance, uh, hopefully, normally a month or so in advance, but certainly no later than a week before the, I have to do the sermon. And I'll read it, and then I'll have a think about it, just quite in a kind of quite a relaxed way, not sort of like really in depth and heavy. You just read the thing and then see if anything jumps out, a word, a phrase, um, or a particular idea. And then over the following days uh, or weeks, I then try and listen to hear what God might be saying about a passage. So if you were here for the last time I did a sermon, you may remember that I spent quite a lot of it just making Rocky Road. Um, uh, it took me a long time to come to the decision that I was actually going to spend about two-thirds of a sermon just making Rocky Road. Uh, I didn't know if that was, one, really appropriate, uh, two, that people would actually stay and listen, three, that it would be interesting, and four, whether this was just me basically showing off. Because uh, those are the questions that you sort of have to ask of yourself. You know, why am I doing the thing that I'm doing? Um, particularly when you're doing something a little bit different, like making Rocky Road. Now, hopefully it was worthwhile. Sometimes, though, when you try to listen to what God is saying about a passage, it can feel like God isn't really speaking, that there's silence, there's no response. And that raises the question, why is God silent about this? Is it something about me? Am I, am I drifting away from God? Am I not listening very well? Is God actually talking, but I'm just not cluing into what he's saying? Or is God silent for some other reason? Teaching me to be patient, for example, or there's something else that God's trying to speak to me about. This sermon this week was one of those weeks where it felt like God was on mute. I tried my usual tricks of trying to get into the passage, but none of them were landing. Read the passage and it'd be like, right, Okay, great. It's another Bible passage. Then yesterday morning, I had a thought. Yesterday morning. <laughs> what if for right now, God had already done all the speaking that needed to happen at that point? See, there aren't many passages in the Bible that simply tell you what to do. <laughs> I know we often think of the Bible as a sort of an instruction book. But it's not, really. Um, there's loads of stories. There's quite a few songs. Uh, there's quite a lot of history. But when you look closely at the Bible, there's surprisingly few passages that just sort of say, this is how you should be. This is how you should act. This, however, the Galatians passage, is one of those passages that just sort of lays it out Quite simply, live in the Spirit, don't do these things, 
be like this. Paul, or whoever wrote Galatians, will have expected this to be read out like a sermon, like this. I mean, not quite like this, obviously, but similar. It's written as a piece of teaching. So, I'm going to read it out again. And we can just take from it what we might normally take from a sermon. So could we have the passage back on the screen, uh, the Galatians 5 passage? Thanks. You may not understand all the words. That's totally fine. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up in the slavery of the law. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. Living by the Spirit's power. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then, you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the exact opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you're not under the obligation to the law of Moses. impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified him there. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. There might be a phrase, something about that, some words, one word, that jumps out at you. There's your sermon. Earlier this week, I was having a chat with Hannah Chester. Some of you may remember her. She was on placement with us last year. She's currently training uh, to be a vicar and is out in Oslo on placement uh, in Norway. She was asked to speak to her, uh, the equivalent of an APCM um, uh, for the church that, in one of the churches that she's on placement with. And she was asked to talk about giving in the Church of England uh, and what it's like in a sort of um, post-lockdown, where we are now sort of scene. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, I work for the Church of England as part of the national giving team. Uh, so she, she decided to give me a call and say, Dave, what's the deal with giving in the Church of England at the moment? So on, uh, on Tuesday morning, I was driving up to the Lake District, and um, we had a good chat in the car. And um, you know when you talk to someone about a subject... And then you realize that you actually do know quite a lot about that subject. That is just, you've just sort of got, taken it in. And you sort of forget that, oh yeah, I actually, I, I know some things. It's quite a nice thing to happen where you're like, oh, that's a nice thought. And this was one of those conversations. 
See, we are all generous. Humankind is generous. Sometimes it really doesn't look like it. Sometimes it really doesn't look like it. But we are. God is a generous God. We see it in creation, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We see it in the ongoing movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the world around us. God is a generous God. And we are made in that image. We are generous. There is a core to us that is generous. Some of us tap into that core. Some of us tap into that characteristic more than others. Some of us throw that core characteristic away, deny it in ourselves. So when I was talking to Hannah, we were talking about various things like contactless donation units and um, the impact of uh, sermons on giving. Very small. Um, and we got to this point where I realized we were heading to the question, but why do we encourage people to give? Just like, why do we do it? Why do we ask people for, for finances? Now, there's one very obvious reason, and that's because all of this costs money, right? Buildings cost money, people cost money, doing ministry and mission often costs money. We need to be able to fund that. And that's why often we ask people for donations to enable this community to continue serve, serving our parish and the world around us. And that's fine. But that's not really why we ask people to give. It's not really why we ask people to be generous. We do it so that people can be generous. We encourage people to connect with that generous side of their personality. We create opportunity for generosity. We ask people to give, enabling them to be generous, to become more Christ-like, to tap into that generosity that will draw them closer to God by being more like God by acting out that generosity, by giving, by sharing of themselves, of each of us, whether that be financially or our time or however we want to be generous, we become more like Christ in the act of doing that. We are drawn closer to God. When you encourage someone to give, you're not simply asking them for money. You are asking them to be more like Christ. The act of giving, of being generous, is a step towards Christ. See, when we read this passage, this passage from Galatians, we often see it as an instruction of how we should be. And it is. How can I be more loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind? In our passage, it was goodness. In some, gen in some translations, it's generous, faithful. Gentleness, self-control. How can I be more of those things? We may pray that. Dear God, please let me be more patient. When Thea's been up all night. And <laughs> but actually also, there's the flip side of it. It's not about us. But how do we work with the Holy Spirit to produce this kind of fruit in our lives, in the lives of those around us, in the lives of us in this building, but also the lives of those people that we come into contact at work, or at school, or on the street, or in the shops, or wherever it may be. Today, we should not be asking, how do I become more like these fruits of the Spirit, but rather, how do I grow these fruits in the, of the Spirit in others? 
How do I enable someone else to become more like Christ? You see, if everyone in this parish was more loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and in self-control, not only would the world be a better place, obviously, but also all of these people would have experienced God at work in their lives. They will have tapped into that characteristic of God in them. Not because we've some sort of preached some great message or anything like that, but because they have become more loving or patient or what have you, they will have grown closer to God. Finding that characteristic of God in them draws them closer to Christ. What is true for us individually is true for the whole world. So how do we grow these characteristics in others? How do we give people the opportunity to be these things? So I'm going to finish with nine questions. Nine. There was a genuine grimace there. (laughs) It's fine. It's absolutely right. Nine questions. Don't worry, you'll see a pattern emerging. Here's question one. How do I encourage people around me to be more loving? How do I encourage people around me to be more joyful? How do I encourage people around me to be more peaceful? How do I encourage people around me to be more patient? How do I encourage people around me to be more kind? How do I encourage people around me to be more generous and good? How do I encourage people around me to be more faithful? How do I encourage people around me to be more gentle? How do I encourage people around me to be more in self-control? Not for our sake, but for the glory of God.